Known as the sixth king of Rome, Servius Tullius was born for greatness. While we know he was said to have reigned between 575 to 535 BC, his early life is shrouded in mystery and rooted in myth. There are those that believe that Servius Tullius was a divine baby, a baby conceived by a woman through an immaculate conception. The famous historian Livy tells us that Servius's mother was a Latin princess or a noblewoman by the name Ocrisia, and that she was captured during the reign of the former king Lucius Tarquinius Priscus at the siege of Corniculum, and subsequently thrown into slavery. It is entirely possible that during this time, the princess was subjugated to being raped, and that she may have become impregnated by a random Roman soldier. However, others lean to the idea that this Latin princess was impregnated by a god. In other variants of this tale, Ocrisia would become a servant to Priscus, while in other versions, she became a Vestal Virgin, a priestess that oversaw the sacred hearth fires, which were said to burn throughout Rome and never allowed to go out, as well as to oversee state rituals, some of which were forbidden to male priests. In one graphic variation, Ocrisia as a Vestal Virgin accidentally dampened the fires of the hearth with a sacrifice, and as a result of her folly, she was penetrated by a disembodied phallus that grew out from the hearth. In this version, Priscus' wife Tanaquil, a woman who was said to have been skilled in the art of deciphering omens, associated this with divine manifestation and that the baby that she was going to give birth to would be one of the gods. In any case, it would become clear that Servius Tullius was not a normal child when it was discovered one night that he had a ring of fire above his head. In this version of the tale, onlookers protested to put the ring of fire out for fear that the sleeping boy would burn, but none moved to act. It's understood that Tanaquil was summoned to view the amazing occurrence for herself. Stunned by what she saw, she immediately brought the boy to her husband Lucius and insisted that he was to be adopted as their own. Whether or not Lucius had much of a say over this matter is unknown, but the young Servius Tullius would be incorporated into the family and even go on to be favoured by Tanaquil over her own children. There are those who naturally dispute such a case, and who dispute Servius's kingship at all, such as the Emperor Claudius, some many years later, who discredits Tullius as being nothing more than an Etruscan mercenary, and that his name was Matstana. Claudius also noted that Matstana was a travelling companion of the Etruscan noble Caelius Verbenna, who was said to have assisted the first king of Rome, Romulus, in the wars with the Sabine leader, Titus Tatius. However, Ribena is also cited as assisting the seventh king, Tarquinius Superbus, which either meant that Ribena somehow lived through five generations, or that records surrounding him are simply unreliable. This puts into question Claudius' discrediting of Tullius. But Servius Tullius as a king certainly had some notable controversies, without Claudius weighing in. For one, he was said to have been the first king to have been elected without gaining the support of the Roman people. This was due to the fact that after his predecessor and stepfather, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, was assassinated, Tanaquil conspired with the Roman Senate and was able to usher in her divine stepson as his replacement. Unlike all the kings before him, this saw Tullius bypass the supporters, of which he would have had to have gained in order to obtain his kingship. But despite his shady ascension to the throne, Tullius proved to be a popular king given his military successes against the people of Vey and the Etruscans. He was able to do as his predecessors had done, and was able to expand Rome even further. Furthermore, his rule would see him benefit the plebeians as he moved to improve their standard of living, bringing fortunes to the lower classes. Of course, this would not bode well with the patricians and the upper classes of Rome. His life as a young man within Tarquinius Priscus's rule is not very well documented, and it's understood that a lot of the divine episodes were kept secret by his mother Ocrisia and his stepmother Tanaquil. Some indicate that Servius Tullius took on the role of a protege, and that he was less of a son to Priscus, and more duty bound. Therefore he didn't receive much in the way of parental affections. This is true in the sense that Tullius marries Priscus and Tanaquil's daughter, Jagania, further establishing himself within their family. 
According to Livy, we see Servius Tullius seem to automatically ascend to the throne when Tarquinius Priscus is assassinated. He was appointed as regent by Tanaquil in the wake of her husband's death, something of which was kept secret from the people. As soon as it became public knowledge, the Senate decided that the best course of action was to elect none other than the regent as king, making him the only king in Rome, as I stated earlier, to become a king without the consent of the people. Plutarch adds that while Servius Tullius agreed to become king, he did so reluctantly, and only at the insistence of Tanaquil. Servius Tullius' reign was a popular one amongst many Romans. He brought them victories against the people of Vei and the Etruscans, and proved to be formidable in military expertise and campaigns. As stated earlier, he would bring fortunes to the poorer classes of Rome, and even enabled the plebeians to vote. Such acts like these were seen as the Servian reforms, and would see to the passing of laws and judgments taken away from the Comitia Curiata, who were essentially a council of 30 members. Ten members of the Curiata represented three of the aristocratic tribes and clans respectively, and each claimed lineage to the original patricians and the founding families of Rome. The Comitia Curiata would also put forth members to join the Roman Senate, and it was the Senate who had the important role of managing the king, helping him to decide laws, and advising him of matters of the state. But by the time Servius Tullius was on the scene, the Comitia Curiata made up the minority of the population, the last few true nobles if you will, and found that they were ruling over the majority. In light of this, Servius Tullius established the Comitia Centuriata, essentially the same thing, but instead of rich nobles being on the council, it was commoners, or the majority if you will, and they would become the lawful body for Rome. With this in mind, Servius Tullius effectively became the first Roman censor, a magistrate who was responsible for the census, public morality, and overseeing governmental finances. For the purpose of the census, civilians of Rome were to register their social rank, household, property, and income, which went towards the establishment of one's tax obligations and one's military service. It can be said that Servius Tullius's invoking of both the Comitia Centuriata and the census was an attempt to phase out the Roman aristocracy, or at least the power they held over the social and military aspects of Rome. The Comitia Curiata did continue to function, though on a much thinner scale. The census also helped assign jobs to certain people, and allowed for a certain expectation in society to be upheld when it came to enlisting in the military. For example, Men aged between 46 and 60 were deemed too old for military combat, but young enough that they were able to serve as home guards or as a policing force. Men aged between 17 and 45, however, were eligible to serve as frontline soldiers, if and when required. The system primarily, though, determined who could vote, as well as how much tax one had to pay. According to Levy, Servius Tullius had two daughters, both of whom were named Tullia, a marriage was arranged between the two Tullias, to the sons of Lucius Tarquinius, also Servius Tullius' stepbrothers. One of the men was also named Lucius Tarquinius, who for the sake of this video, I'll refer to as Tarquinius Jr., while the other was named Aaron's Tarquinius. In some accounts, these are actually the grandsons of Lucius Tarquinius, and not his direct sons. It was these marriages that would spell the end of Servius Tullius. The younger Tullia, otherwise known as Tullia Minor, was an ambitious and cunning woman. She demonstrated far more ruthlessness than her older sister, and willed for nothing more than to be queen herself. When married to Aaron's Tarquinius, she learned that he was a mild man, one who was content with the way of his life, and sought for no more. In contrast, his brother Lucius was far more ambitious, and sought to be king. Tullia and Tarquinius Jr. had more in common with each other than they did with their own respective husband and wife, and so together, they sought to the killing of their spouses and then married each other. Together, they now set their sights on the throne. Tullia, like Tanaquil, seemed to have a sense for manipulation. She was able to encourage Tarquinius Jr. into bribing senators into an audience, where he slammed Servius Tullius for his rule over Rome. He criticised Servius for being born a slave, 
and that he had not won the vote of the people the way the former kings had. Not only this, but he also condemned his mother Tanaquil for handling the throne to Servius without him ever having to fight for it. It's possible that he may have been extremely jealous over Servius, given that Tanaquil was said to favour him over both of her biological sons, and that Servius had been treated by his mother as a divine being. He also criticised the fact that Servius had favoured the lower class, and neglected the wealthy, and had taken away their lands, and spoon-fed them to the plebeians. He also saw the census as an intrusion of privacy, given that the wealthy now had their earnings exposed, creating an envy and bad blood between families and neighbours. During this rant, Servius Tullius arrived at the Senate House, but was met by Tarquinius Jr who threw him down a set of stairs before kicking him out onto the street. As this happened, Tarquinius Jr's men swarmed Servius and murdered him in cold blood. To add insult to injury, Tullia then rode her chariot over her father's body in a chilling act of wickedness. Livy tells us that Tarquinius Jr refused to allow Tullius to be buried in what is described as a petty and morbidly cruel act. It would earn him the name Superbus, meaning arrogant or proud, a name that would follow him for the rest of his days. Livy goes on to tell us that the murder of Servius Tullius was a tragic crime, and calls it a dark time in Roman history, one that would lead to the abolishment of the Roman monarchy altogether. Servius Tullius' divine conception was no doubt embellished long after his death, but it may have been hyped up by Tanaquil so as to increase the appeal to the people of having a king who, like Romulus, would be part man and part god. However, he was still put in place by the Senate, and so it leads me to believe that Servius Tullius certainly had the charisma and the know-how when it came to people. He not only struck a blow to the patricians with his rule, but he was also unafraid and unapologetic about the social repercussions. It is his boldness, courage and general will to do the fair and right things by his people, coupled with his supposedly divine birth, that would paint him as something of a second Romulus to his people. Because of Servius Tullius, the common folk of Rome got the chance to shine, and were given the opportunity that they might not have ever gotten under a more tyrannical and selfish ruler. The Servian reforms saw ordinary men become huge influences in Roman politics, and allowed them to participate in the government's decisions, despite the backlash it earned from the patricians. The creation of the Comitio Centuriata would see the plebeians gain an ever-growing foothold in the once patrician-dominated climate. It would also eventually give birth to the plebeian nobility. Like Plutarch states about Servius Tullius, I certainly agree that Servius Tullius had his people's best interests in mind, and that he himself was perhaps the wisest, most fortunate, and perhaps best of all of Rome's kings. Let me know what you thought about Servius Tullius in the comments below, and what you thought about his tragic end. In the next video, we'll be looking at Tarquinius Superbus, the final king of Rome, before we move on to a few videos about the Roman Republic, which would take over after him. Until then, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time guys.